If you know me, you know that I'm an optimist. I don't like talking down about movies. It doesn't make me feel good. I like being cheery and very positive. But there are 10 movies, guys, that I saw in 2020 that we need to talk about because they're awful. What's going on you guys, James here, and today we're going to dive into my 10 worst movies of 2020. As we inch closer to the new year, I thought, why not reminisce on some of my least favorite moments in movies? Now guys, before we get into this list, and I mentioned some dishonorable films, because you know how there's usually honorable mentions, I'm saying dishonorable, you get the joke. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the big red button below, subscribe to the channel, and tap on that bell so you don't miss out on any content moving in to 2021. We got some Cobra Kai to talk about, some more reviews and reactions, and lists just like this. And if you haven't, smash that like button and get loud in the comments below and let me know which movies were your least favorite this year. Do you have a top 10 or technically it's a bottom 10? Let me know what you guys have to say in the comments below. So guys, let's get into some dishonorable mentions for 2020. These are films that just barely missed my bottom 10 of the year, starting with The Doolittle, led by Robert Downey Jr. It's a movie that actually plays better on the big screen than I'd imagine it does at home. I don't hate the sense of adventure I got from it, however, there is a lack of cohesion and none of the jokes are very funny. And then there's The Lie, with Joey King and Peter Sarsgaard. This was also a part of the Blumhouse collection. Guys, I'm not a big fan of this film. It's got a decent premise, I don't think that the movie's found foundation is at fault here. I think it's the execution for the most part. And um, mm, boy, man, that ending, just awful. And then another Joey King film, The Kissing Booth 2. See, I didn't hate this movie completely because there is this cute sense of fun in a rom-com setting with Joey King. Again, she's wasted in this role because she is so good. And unfortunately, The Kissing Booth 2 is maybe a little bit worse than the first film, honestly. I could not stand it. I mean, they're making a third. I heard they already filmed the third, so I, I guess we're just gonna have to sit through that one together, guys. Next up is Harrison Ford's The Call of the Wild. I saw this in a press screening, and I'm not gonna lie, a lot of the visuals were impressive. I don't think the CGI was as bad with the dog as many were making it out to be. However, to me, a lot of the dialogue here was forced. I don't think the writing was very strong at all. And unfortunately, nothing about this movie is very memorable. I could not tell you one scene that impacted me, maybe outside of that final 10 minute stretch, but see, the thing is, the movie really tries to hit a home run, and it kind of fails. So, uh, The Call of the Wild, uh, maybe this is one call you should miss. And one movie that fell right outside of my bottom 10, Janelle Monae's Antebellum. Guys, this movie's just awful. I'm sorry. It's just really bad. It tries to really touch up on the topic of slavery, and guys... I don't need to see Janelle Monet in this sort of movie for me to get an understanding of how bad it was in the Civil War era. I mean, ugh, gosh, this movie is a mess, and that is probably understating how messy this movie is. The twist is not good at all, and guys, I did not for one second feel very convinced by anyone's acting outside of Janelle Monet. The only reason this movie is not number 10 on my bottom 10 of the year is because of Janelle Monet. She tries. She tries really hard. But the direction, the writing, sorry guys, I just couldn't buy into it. Alrighty, so let's get into my bottom 10 of the year, beginning at number 10. And that is Netflix's Rebecca, directed by Ben Wheatley, starring Lily James and Army Hammer. This is a new take on the classic novel by Daphne du Maur, and Alfred Hitchcock did something similar. This isn't the same exact ripoff of Alfred Hitchcock's movie from what I've been told, but his 1940 classic was at least thrilling from what I have uh, heard from so many others, because I haven't seen it myself yet. But what I will say is that this version is just bad. The movie tries to mix romance and elements of a thriller, but it becomes an entire mess. Guys, neither Army Hammer nor Lily James, surprisingly enough, because I think they're both good actors, they could not save this movie. I didn't buy their chemistry together. Nothing about this movie was even remotely convincing. And the entire second act of the film was a complete drag. The only positive? Kristen Scott Thomas as Mrs. Danvers. But otherwise, a completely forgettable movie. 
So let's move on to number nine, Downhill. Directed by Nat Faxon and Jim Rash, starring Will Ferrell and Julia Louise Dreyfus. It's inspired by Ruben Oslin's film Force Majeure. Seeing this in theaters really did help me appreciate the snow-capped mountains, the beautiful wide range of the landscape. It was so cool to be engrossed in this film for the first 10 minutes. But after that, y'all, I wasn't laughing. And the thing is about a comedy movie, for it to be effective, it needs to make the audience laugh. It didn't make me laugh once. But what it did succeed at doing is showing us the other side of Will Ferrell's career, which is full of misfires and misses. The script really tries to make us play sides with this dysfunctional marriage between Julia Louise Dreyfus and Will Ferrell, but the only side I played is the one that says this is one of the worst performances of either actor's career, and man, this is just a disappointing movie overall. It had so much potential, and it just fell really flat. Ugh. My number 8 worst movie of the year is My Hindu Friend, directed by Hector Babenko, starring Willem Dafoe. If you don't know much about this movie, it's okay because it was originally playing at film festivals in 2016 before Hector Babenko's untimely death. This is actually the last film before his death and is in large part based on on his life. The funny thing is, with Willem Dafoe in the lead role, I was 100% on board with this movie, but after the first act, I found myself liking this film less and less. It has really up and down pacing for the most part, and I didn't really care for a lot of the dialogue in this film. Willem Dafoe couldn't even save this film. For the most part, there is some cool aspect to this movie, especially towards the end where you see Willem Dafoe interact with his friend in chemotherapy, and there are some emotional beats, but they're just not executed properly, and there are some really weird moments in this movie that don't feel like they fit the flow of the film, and then I started to wonder if there's even a flow to this movie. So even though it was getting some play in 2016, maybe it should have got a wider release in 2016, because even though 2020 is a mess, Guys, this movie doesn't hold a candle to most of the films this year. Alrighty, so let's move on to number 7, Irresistible, directed by Jon Stewart, starring Steve Carell, Rose Byrne, and Chris Cooper. This is Jon Stewart's second feature-length debut after Rosewater, and here's a movie that I was really curious about, especially after the trailer and seeing this all-star cast. And knowing Jon Stewart, who's not only a great comedic personality, but I feel like he has a knack for good writing, it seems to me, at least, that maybe, just maybe, this film should have taken on a different approach. The film surprisingly fell completely flat and most of the jokes were a little too on the nose and I could never care for Rose Burns over the top, over sexualized acting here. It didn't make the movie funny and even though it was making Steve Carell's character uncomfortable and that was possibly the intention, it didn't really do anything for me as an audience member. I wasn't laughing, I didn't even chuckle. I mean, gosh, in a comedy movie, you gotta laugh. And Steve Carell, I love him. I think he's talented not only as a comedic actor, but as a dramatic actor. He is just honestly boring in this movie. Like, I understand that his character is supposed to be uptight. It's all about me. I'm egotistical. But he couldn't even handle that kind of swagger in this film. And I don't even care too much for this twist. That guy's twists are not supposed to save a film. If that's their sole intention, to get you interested all over again for the final 10 minutes, that must mean the rest of the film was pretty awful. And that's the case here with Irresistible. I just, I'm sorry. But that film is not as bad as number six, Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga, directed by David Dobkin, starring Rachel McAdams, Will Ferrell, and Dan Stevens. First of all, this would get the number one worst title of the year. Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga is not only a terrible name for a movie, but boy, this film is just not funny. Guys, and is it any surprise that another Will Ferrell movie is on this bottom 10 list? I said it in my downhill review, and I'll say it again here. Will Ferrell is taking some questionable roles, and maybe he thinks it sounds funny on paper, because the premise of this movie is actually a decent premise on paper, but when translated to the screen, it is neither funny, nor dramatic, nor anything that has to be. The only moment that got me to laugh was a guy in a bar screaming, play Ya Ya Ding Dong, and that probably happens twice in the movie for a total of one minute of screen time. And not only is that insignificant because the film is just overly long, there's also this issue with Dan Stevens being wasted. He's a good actor, and in this role, I mean, yeah, he has this sort of surprise musical number, but ugh, gosh... Why was this movie made the way it was? I think that we could have done without this film in 2020, but I mean, hey, at least the costumes looked okay, right? 
Moving on now to number 5, Evil Eye, directed by Rajiv and Ilan Dasani, starring Sarita Churi, Sunita Mani, and Omar Mascati. This is yet another movie that's a part of the Blumhouse collection, which was streaming exclusively on Prime Video. You can find some of these films on there now. I was actually pretty excited for this film, because at the time I had been binge-watching Mr. Robo, which stars Sunita Mani. She gives a great performance in that series, but here, nobody, and I mean nobody, convinced me with their acting. There's a lack of cohesive dialogue throughout the movie that makes the story feel a little bogged down and every line does feel made for TV. I didn't think any of the thrills were all that thrilling and when we get towards that middle of the movie where you start to figure out the entire plot, I pretty much saw every twist and turn coming. It was a little too predictable and even though I know it's a smaller budget film, nothing about this movie was pretty redeeming. So let's get into number four, The Hunt, directed by Craig Zobel, starring Betty Gilpin and Hilary Swank. First of all, Hilary Swank is actually pretty awesome, and Betty Gilpin is a boss in this film as well. This is actually the second to last movie I watched in theaters before the pandemic, and man, this movie is just not very... Ugh. The movie tries to do what others have done before it, The Purge, and other political films that poke fun at the big wigs in Washington, D.C., but outside of the first 20 minutes, you guys, I was entirely uninterested in anything the film had to say. It tries to make this statement, right? It's grandstanding sometimes, and I don't think that the film is, one, important enough, and two, good enough to make any sort of statement. It tries to be funny. It's not that. It tries to make a point about government. It doesn't do that very well either. And then it just says, you know what, let's throw out a gratuitous amount of violence and hope that we'll keep you guys around. This is a half-baked idea, guys, that should have remained as a draft because after 2020, there's no reason why we need to have movies like this anymore. Okay? Okay. Let's move on to number three, Fat Man, directed by Isham and Ian Nelm, starring Mel Gibson, Marianne Jean Baptiste, and Walton Goggins. I'm a huge Walton Goggins fan. If you are, put your hand up. I can't see you. But I think that I can tell you I've never seen a Christmas movie quite like this. That is the only positive I can give to this movie. And is that even a positive? Because what I'm about to say to follow that up with is not very positive at all. This movie is bad. It's terrible. It is not very good at all. Are there any other adjectives I can give you guys? What I can say about Fat Man is that Walton Goggins again proves that he can be a lead. He can be a good antagonist. He is a good actor. But why does he continue to take roles like this where he is just wasted? Then there's this kid who Walton Goggins works for who's annoying and not in a fun way. And then how could I forget about Mel Gibson who is a blue collar worker that is Santa Claus. So it's a cool different approach I guess. But in every scene, he's wooden. He barely did any acting, and when he's alongside his wife in the film, Marianne Jean Baptiste, who deserves better, he's as stiff as can be. Fat Man is a movie that will not be on my holiday rotation, and is one that we'll probably forget about pretty quickly as we head into 2021. Alrighty guys, we're in the bottom two now, so let's start with number two, Monster Hunter, directed by Paul W.S. Anderson and starring Mila Jovovich and Tony Jaw. Guys, pinch me if you've heard this one before. Yet another failed video game adaptation by Paul W.S. Anderson. Monster Hunter is everything wrong with video game movies. D-level movie dialogue, really crummy acting, and a story that isn't honoring the source material, and it's just simply rushing to get to the final fight and falling flat on its face. Now I love Mila Jovovich, I do think her acting is really good, and I appreciate the fact that she wants to continue to work with her husband, but maybe they can consider passing along that mantle of video game adaptation films to someone else, because I just don't think that they need to do this anymore. We've seen this formula again and again and again, and it doesn't work. So can we stop with movies like this, please? Pretty please? Now that was going to be my worst movie of 2020, if not for this next film. Coming in at number one, the worst movie of 2020, Two Hearts, directed by Lance Houle, starring Jacob Elordi and Aiden Kanto. I actually just finished watching season one of Euphoria on HBO Max, and I think that Jacob Elordi doesn't do a bad job in that, but I gotta ask guys, after seeing him first in The Kissing Booth parts one and two this year, and then Two Hearts, and then Euphoria, can you guys explain to me what happened with Jacob Elordi? The acting in this film overall isn't even lifetime worthy, it's below that. Jacob Elordi, again, kind of proves that he doesn't have much range outside of Euphoria, and that is kind of a shame because Man, I feel like he has the potential, right? The ceiling is a little bit higher than his floor, but guys, forget it. 
I just, I can't handle him in another role like this. And I wonder who exactly thought it would be a good idea to make this film nearly two hours long. I'm a sucker for romance, okay? I love a good love story, but there's no connection in any sort of chemistry between Jacob Elordi and his love interest in the movie, Tierra Scovey. I... Just like how? How do you mess that up in a romance film? I didn't buy their love, but wait, there's another storyline that the movie tries to flesh out, led by Aiden Kanto. The film tries to give you another couple. It's like a separate, it's a B storyline, so you have plot A and plot B, and dude, none of that was executed well, okay? I'm speaking with my hands here. This is just the dreadful experience, and the movie really tries to hit a home run in the final act, but all it did was end up making me put my face into my hands. I honestly cannot recommend this film to anyone. Even if you're a fan of Jacob Elordi, don't watch this. Go go and watch The Kissing Booth 2, or even Euphoria again, but man, this is just not a film that I can even remotely say has one redeemable factor about it. I guess I expected at least a cohesive film from Lance Hull, who is credited as a producer on Man on Fire, but hey, after not directing a movie since 1999, maybe it's a good idea for Lance Hull to stay out of the director's chair from this point on. Alrighty you guys, well there you have it, that is my list of 10 worst movies of 2020, so let's recap in case you skipped all the way to the end. Number 10 is Rebecca, number 9, Downhill, number 8, My Hindu Friend, number 7, Irresistible. Number six, Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga. Number five, Evil Eye. Number four, The Hunt. Number three, Fat Man. Number two, Monster Hunter. And the worst film of 2020, Two Hearts. Man, that was fun, but I'm also sad because I just don't like talking about movies in this pessimistic way. So you know what? We're going to follow this video up with my 10 best movies of 2020 so far. And the reason I say so far is because there are some films that are getting a wider release in January, February before the Academy Awards. So I'll be sure to add those to my list, but I'll give you guys my top 10 of the year up to this point. So I cannot wait for that, guys. If you don't want to miss out, go ahead and hit the big red button below. Subscribe to the channel. Tap on that bell so you don't miss out on any new content. Go ahead and smash that like button if you haven't as well. And get loud in the comments below. Let me know what your 10 worst movies of the year are because this was fun but I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. Alrighty, again, thank you so much for checking this out with me, guys, and I'll catch you at the next screening.